Hey guys, I'm Georgia and welcome back for the second instalment of my dark fairy tale series in which I tell you the original stories and all the history behind the Disney-fied fairy tales that we know and love today. In my last episode I spoke about Sleeping Beauty, about how that story is centuries old with origins in oral tradition, how nobody really knows for sure where this story originally came from, it's likely the amalgamation of many different folk tales before going through the Charles Perrault and Brothers Grimm treatments and eventually reaching the Disney animation team. Our story today, the story of the Snow Queen, the inspiration behind Frozen, doesn't quite have such a long history, but its rumoured origins are still fascinating and comes from the brain of another father of fairy tales, Hans Christian Andersen. But before we get into the story, I want to say a huge thank you to June's Journey for sponsoring this video, a mobile game that I've played and loved for a very, very long time. June's Journey is a hidden object mystery game where you play detective and try and solve the murder mystery of June's sister. June's Journey is completely free to download and is available on Android and iOS mobile devices as well as on PC through Facebook games. The object of the game is to find clues in these hidden object scenes in order to take you further into the story, discovering new characters in the mystery, piecing together photographs, slowly, step by step, finding out what happened. As you progress through each chapter, the hidden object scenes become more complicated, relying on your detective eye and memory to find the objects and hopefully unlock a clue. And all the while, you're also trying to renovate the old rundown land belonging to June's family and bring it back to its former glory. The more land you can renovate, the faster you can progress through the chapters. It will be no surprise to anyone that I really enjoy the mystery aspect of this game. I love slowly unravelling the story and trying to figure out what's going on. I mean, researching some of the heavy topics I do for my channel, sometimes I do just need to take a minute out and switch off at my desk, and June's journey keeps my brain working whilst not being too heavy or confusing until I can get back to work. You can download June's Journey by clicking on the link down below in the description box. Like I said, it's completely free and I know so many of you will really enjoy this. So Hans Christian Andersen was a Danish author. He was born in April 1905 and from the very beginning his life was surrounded by all kinds of fantasy and speculation. His father, Hans Senior, considered himself to be nobility, even though there's no evidence to suggest that was the case, he was just a cobbler, and his mother, Anne-Marie Anderstatter, was a washerwoman. If history is to be believed, Hans came from very humble beginnings. However, there is a fairy tale esque rumour that's followed his legacy, suggesting that Hans and Anne might not have been his real parents. Instead, he may have been the illegitimate son of King Christian VIII of Denmark and Danish aristocrat Elise Lorvig. The story basically goes that this pair were unable to read because Christian, who was simply crown prince this time, had to save himself from marriage of political alliance. So when Elise gave birth to their baby boy, he was given to the washerwoman, who was already considered to be a fallen woman as she already had one daughter out of wedlock. The washerwoman in question... Anne. There's no way of knowing whether this is fact or fiction, but there's no denying there were many anomalies in Hans's life. Despite being from such humble beginnings, he would end up attending quite a prestigious grammar school from 1822 to 1826. Records show that he paid more than twice as much as mother students to attend the school, and that tuition had been traced back to the royal family, but somehow his name never appears on the rolls. Hans's only existing birth certificate wasn't even issued until 1823 when he was 17 years old, yet he had to have a birth certificate to enrol in this school. So who was pulling those strings? I mean, the parents who raised him, Hans and Anne, wouldn't have had that much power. But there's long been rumours that an illegitimate son of Prince Christian was also born in April 1905, the rumour being that the child was given to good people. Someone with the same name as Hans's mother who just happened to work at the castle. But after that point, all traces of this mysterious woman seemed to vanish. Is this all a coincidence or could it be true? Did Hans Christian Andersen become so fascinated by fairy tales because his life kind of was one? 
Well, we don't know for sure. I don't know if these rumours will ever be substantiated. But what we do know is that Prince Christian, later King Christian, would pay a lot of visits to the quiet town where the school was located over the years. And apparently, despite his humble beginnings, Hans would often be invited as a child to the castle for playdates with Christian's son. So take from that what you will. But this isn't a mystery video about the genetics of Hans Christian Andersen, this is about his stories. He wrote his first fairy tale called The Tallow Candle in the 1820s about a candle that just didn't feel appreciated. But he didn't see his first success until 1829 with a short story that's snappily titled A Journey on Foot from Holman's Canal to the East Point of Amager. From there, the hits would just keep on coming. Reports say that Hans turned to writing as somewhat of a release. He'd had a very troubled life, he was picked on a lot, his father died when he was a young teenager and he was forced to go and work in a factory where he'd get pretty bullied by other workers for his high squeaky voice and just general lankiness. Then he got sent to the aforementioned school and he described that as the darkest time of his life. It seems that Hans always had it in him to be an artist of some description. He originally went for the musical theatre route, so actor, singer, ballet dancer. But clearly at some point, luckily, he realised his talent lie in writing and in his imagination. In 1835, he released his first novel, The Improvisator, which was published to instant acclaim, the story reflecting how he'd been travelling around Italy. Then in May 1835, he released the first of three instalments of his first fairy tale book, Fairy Tales Told for Children, a collection of nine tales. The first instalment contained the stories The Tinderbox, Little Claws and Big Claws, Little Ida's Flowers, and one which very much has held the test of time, The Princess and the Pea. Three of those stories were based on folk tales Hans had heard throughout his childhood, whereas Little Ida's Flowers was an original story. The second instalment was published in December 1835, including his original story, Thumbelina, as well as The Naughty Boy and The Travelling Companion. The third part wouldn't be published till April 1837, featuring The Little Mermaid and The Emperor's New Clothes, huge stories we still know and love today. Despite how many of these stories have stood the test of time, critics at the time were not all too thrilled. These stories were deemed to be way too immoral for children, they were practically scandalous. Children's literature at this time was simply to educate, not to provide entertainment. That's why there was such a gap between the second and third booklets being published, they just weren't going down very well. But luckily for us, Hans and his imagination were not deterred. Our focus today, The Snow Queen, wouldn't come along until 1844, published in December in New Fairy Tales, first volume, second collection. Really got those snappy titles. It's a tale focusing on the struggle between good and evil, and actually ended up becoming one of his longest and most highly acclaimed stories, a story that defies time. I mean, just look at Frozen Fever that gripped the world back in 2013. As I mentioned at the beginning of this episode, The Snow Queen is unlike so many other fairy tales because there's no obvious previous version of it. It's speculated that Anderson was inspired to write the story thanks to an unrequited love, as so many stories begin. Some of you might know the name Jenny Lind, the Swedish opera singer who many think is one of the best to ever have existed. I mean, her name, she even makes a feature in the movie The Greatest Showman, in case you're wondering where you've heard the name before. Hans and Jenny likely met when she toured Denmark in 1843, and the story goes that he instantly fell in love with her. He wrote her passionate love letters, but it seems she never quite reciprocated his feelings, calling him her brother. This led to him writing The Nightingale that very same year, and this would lead to Jenny's enduring moniker, The Swedish Nightingale. And although it was never confirmed for sure, it's thought that the character of the Snow Queen, the villain in the story, and therefore likely the whole story, was inspired by Jenny Lind and Hans's love for her. He was pretty hurt by her rejection, it seems. But what was the story of the Snow Queen? Well, get ready, because we're about to go on a wild ride with seven parts in total. Our story begins with a very wicked hobgoblin who's said to be one of the worst and a real demon. 
One day he crafted a looking glass in which anything beautiful or good reflected in it would shrink to nothing, whilst anything that was worthless or bad would be increased in size. The story reads, the most lovely landscapes appeared like boiled spinach and the people became hideous and looked as if they stood on their heads and had no bodies. Their countenances were so distorted that no one could recognise them and even one freckle on the face appeared to spread over the whole of the nose and mouth. The looking glass was meant to be a reflection of what mankind was really like, a true reflection of humanity. And this hobgoblin, of course, ran his own school in which he taught other little demons to do demon things. And the demons at the school began to carry this glass everywhere until there wasn't a single land or person on this earth that hadn't been looked at through it. But they got greedy and wanted to fly up to heaven to see the reflection of the angels. Only as they flew upwards, the glass got slippery and fell out of their hands, falling back to earth and smashing into a million pieces, flying all over the world. Some of these tiny fragments of this looking glass got caught in people's eyes, causing them to forever see the world through this distorted lens. If someone got a piece of the looking glass in their heart, the heart would become a lump of ice. Part two of the story involves two children, a boy called Kay and a girl named Gerda. They were neighbours who lived opposite each other and they loved each other as siblings, playing together every day. Their houses were so close they could step across the gutter from one window to another. Seeing as they lived in quite a busy town, there wasn't any green space to play in, so the kids and adults had to make do with what they had. Their parents each had a large wooden box in which they grew herbs for cooking as well as another box for roses. The boxes were so large out the window so they connected the two houses as one. In the winter, the boxes and the windows would freeze and the children wouldn't be allowed to climb out. So instead they would boil pennies and use the heat to melt the ice on the glass so they could make small holes to look at each other. Even when they couldn't play together, they found ways to be together. One winter evening, Kay climbed on a chair by the window to peep out of the hole, seeing snow falling outside. Slowly, the snowflakes grew larger and larger until they formed the figure of a woman who looked like a million snowflakes all joined together. This woman was fair and beautiful, but made of ice, shining and glittering in the light. She waved at Kay and he jumped away and then she disappeared. Spring soon came after that, then summer, and Kay and Gerda were reunited once more, sitting next to the plant boxes at the windows. One day they were looking through a picture book together when Kay exclaimed, Oh, something struck my heart, and then there's something in my eye. Gerda couldn't see anything when she looked, but of course it was one of the pieces of the looking glass floating in the summer air. A piece of the glass had got caught in Kay's heart, quickly turning it to ice. And all at once, his entire personality changed and he started to be mean to Gerda, insulting her and pulling out their parents' roses. This would last for a number of months, till winter when he said one day that he was going to the Great Square to play with the other boys with his sledge in hand. When he got there though, a greater sledge came by, painted white, and someone was sat inside it, wrapped in white fur. Kay was intrigued and strapped his own sledge to it, so when it went away, he followed, taking him away from the town into a winter wonderland. When they eventually stopped, it would transpire that the person in the sledge was, of course, the Snow Queen, taking Kay in as her own. The, the story goes, Kay looked at her and saw that she was so beautiful, he could not imagine a more lovely and intelligent face. She did not now seem to be made of ice, as when he'd seen her through his window and she had nodded to him. In his eyes, she was perfect, and he did not feel at all afraid. Part three of the story is entitled The Flower Garden of the Woman Who Could Conjure, about how Gerda fayed in Kay's absence. He just went missing one day, nobody knew what became of him, and Gerda wept for a long time, fearing him dead. One day she threw her prized red shoes into the river as an offering in the hope that Kay would return, but it was futile. So one day she gets in a boat and drifts out of town herself, soon meeting an old lady who she befriends. The old lady has a flower garden which Gerda talks to in the hope that the flowers will provide the answers that she seeks, but they only reply in riddles. When autumn comes, she realises that she's been wasting her time and she must continue on her journey, despite the world becoming darker and more dreary every day. At the beginning of the fourth story, she meets the crow and asks him if he's seen Kay. 
The crow nods and says, perhaps I have. Gerda was so happy, she kissed the crow and hugged him almost to death. The crow explains that Kay might be living with a princess, a princess who's so wonderfully clever that she's read all the newspapers in the world. Apparently this princess had decided she wanted to get married, so newspapers were published immediately, giving notice to every young man that they were free to visit the palace and try and woo her. Of course, people came in crowds, but no one ever succeeded in impressing the princess. As soon as they entered the palace, the young men tended to become very confused and forgetting themselves and making a fool of themselves. But what does this have to do with Kay? Gerda asks. Well, apparently on the third day, there came a boy marching into the palace, no horse or carriage, his eyes sparkling just like Gerda's with beautiful long hair, but very poor clothes. Apparently this young man was not embarrassed at all about clearly being poor and Gerda exclaimed it must have been Kay. So she travels to the palace to find him, only when she arrives, the prince is not Kay, although he did look like him. Thank God, because Kay was just a child. The prince and princess give Gerda a coach and a warm coat so she can continue on her journey. And then, of course, Gerda gets captured by robbers and is taken to their big castle, where she meets a little robber girl whose dove tells Gerda that Kay was taken by the Snow Queen to her palace up north. The robber girl eventually helps free her, and with the help of a reindeer, a woman from Lapland, and a woman from Finland, she travels north to the coldest parts of Scandinavia, where she eventually reaches the palace of the Snow Queen. The two women tell her that Kay has a piece of broken glass in his heart and in his eye. These must be taken out, or he'll never be human again, forever under the control of the Snow Queen. And as Gerda approaches the palace, an army of snowflakes come around her, getting larger the closer they got. These were the guards of the Snow Queen. So Gerda recites the Lord's Prayer under her breath, the steam of her breath appearing to take the shape of little angels, all wearing helmets with spears and shields, eventually allowing her to get through safely. The walls of the palace were formed of drifted snow with more than a hundred rooms, the largest of which extended on for several miles, lit up by the northern lights. Large, empty, cold and glittering. Gerda found little Kay there, who was blue with cold, almost black, but he didn't feel it, for the Snow Queen had kissed away all the icy shiverings and his heart was already made of ice. Just before Gerda had arrived, the Snow Queen had told Kay that she was going to warm a country where she was going to look in the top of burning mountains, volcanoes, Etna, Vesuvius, and make them look white. She flew away and Gerda entered, but Kay didn't respond to her, still stiff and cold. At that point, Gerda started to cry. Hot tears fell onto his chest and penetrated into his heart, immediately thawing away the lump of ice and washing away the glass. Then Kay looked at Gerda and wept himself, washing the splinter of glass out of his eye. He cried, Gerda, dear little Gerda, where have you been all this time and where have I been? Then they took each other's hands and walked out of the palace, Gerda sharing the story of her travels. They drank warm milk from the reindeer who took them to the Finnish woman who warmed them up before giving them directions back home. The woman from Lapland made some new clothes for them and put their sleighs in order. Then they began their journey back home, coming across the robber girl again and thanking her, and with each step they took towards home, spring became closer. Once they got home, they both sat there, grown up, yet children at heart, and it was summer. Warm, beautiful summer. If any of you watched the video I made on the original tale of Sleeping Beauty, you can probably all agree that whilst this is still on the darker side, this story was nowhere near as dark as that one, probably because it is a bit more recent. But what was the moral of this story? Maybe it's for children not to trust adults outside of their immediate family. Maybe it's to keep a childlike heart. After all, it was Gerda's kindness and pure love that allowed her tears to save Kay. Maybe it's that love can always overcome darkness and evil, how strong sibling love can be. Even if Kay and Gerda weren't actual siblings, they certainly thought of each other as so. And then you've got the looking glass, which is said to represent the cynicism of adulthood destroying the youthfulness of childhood. 
Once K becomes infected with his cynicism, he wants to abandon Gerda and go off to play with the older boys. He becomes a surly teenager, not through any fault of his own. It just happened to him, as it does happen to so many people as they grow up. You might have also noticed though that in comparison with a lot of other fairy tales, the villain, the evil Snow Queen in this case, doesn't get her comeuppance, neither does the hobgoblin who created the mirror. The Snow Queen just simply flies off to the warmer climates and we never hear from her again. There's no big moment of defeat. Sometimes evil doesn't always get what it deserves, sometimes life just continues on and you've got to be happy that you've got your own happy ending. This is one of the reasons why the Snow Queen really was quite forward thinking for its time. But also you've got the fact that this wasn't a prince saving a damsel in distress and then getting married as the happy ending. Nope, this is a girl who loves her faux brother so much she's willing to put her own life in danger to save him. It's a tale of the purest kind of love. A young girl here is the hero. Hans Christian Andersen is a feminist, confirmed. You could be forgiven for thinking that the history of this story went from the Snow Queen to Disney's Frozen and that's that, but elements of this story have inspired so many others over the last couple of centuries. I mean, C.S. Lewis's The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe undoubtedly took inspiration, with the White Witch luring Edmund away from the other children. Both the Snow Queen and the White Witch appear to wear warm white fur coats and just appear into the snow. And then you've got Philip Pullman's Northern Lights. Lyra journeys to the frozen north to find her basically brother Roger, the same as Gerd did. Through pureness and kindness just like Gerda, Lyra has to convince adults to help her on her quest along the way. And not only did the Snow Queen inspire these very popular books come movies, TV shows, it's also been adapted into countless operas and ballets over the years. Disney actually first showed interest in this all the way back in the 1940s, when lots of Anderson stories were being explored to potentially become animated. Although the possibility did get shelved at the time and other Anderson fairy tales got in there first, Little Mermaid anyone, it clearly wasn't shelved for good. In the 1970s they looked at the story again for a possible Disneyland attraction called the Enchanted Snow Palace, but that never ended up coming to fruition. Eventually, in the early 2000s, the Snow Queen began its very slow transformation into Frozen. When the movie was eventually released in 2013, Frozen very quickly became the highest grossing animated film of all time. Any guesses which animated film it was eventually beaten by in 2019? Frozen 2, of course. And then later that same year, the live action Lion King apparently, although that does feature CGI animation in a mix of live action footage. So does that count? fight amongst yourselves. I'm sure we've all seen Frozen, but let's take a look at it in comparison to the original Snow Queen. So undeniably, the link is there, with Elsa literally being the Snow Queen. But she is not a villain in Frozen, she's simply misunderstood and lost. When the king and queen, the parents of princesses Elsa and Anna, tragically die, Elsa is to become queen far sooner than anyone ever intended. But Elsa is hiding a secret, her mysterious powers with which she can control ice and snow, and she's also seemingly unaffected by the cold. Her parents taught her to hide her powers away because people would be scared of her if they knew. So when at Elsa's coronation she loses control and shows her powers, and accidentally sets off an eternal winter in the kingdom of Arendelle, she runs away up north. Once again, the story is set in Scandinavia, specifically in Norway, and in this version, Elsa doesn't lure a child away with her. Instead, she isolates herself, building an impressive ice castle, fashions herself an ice dress, and commits herself to this isolation forever. This way, she can't ever hurt anyone else. Elsa is cold by necessity, but she's never been able to let anyone else in to see the true her. She's not the villain here, she's just misunderstood and confused. The character of the Snow Queen is merged with that of Kay, a Snow Queen and a sibling all in one. In the Snow Queen, Gerda has the crow, robber girl, doves, reindeer and two women helping her on her journey. And when Anna sets off on her mission to find her sister and bring her home, those characters are replaced by the standard Disney sidekicks. You have Olaf the talking snowman, goofy kind Kristoff and his reindeer Sven. 
Although Arno is now recently engaged to Prince Hans back at home after meeting him at the coronation and instantly falling in love, Kristoff is clearly meant to be the nicer alternative, the one she's supposed to be with. Actually, the whole quick proposal thing with Arna and Prince Hans, who I'm sure is named after Hans Christian Andersen, is a direct dig at the traditional Disney princess movie where the prince and princess meet and instantly fall in love and get married. When Arna tells Elsa she's engaged, she's told that she can't marry someone she's just met. A clear attempt from Disney to move into a new era of movie, an era not focused on romantic love, but instead on strength, platonic love, sisterhood. But of course, this is still Disney, so they did have to have Kristoff in there as well, the golden retriever type personality, so much better suited to Anna. Once, after a treacherous journey, Anna finds Elsa in her new ice castle, they fight, and Elsa, not in control of her powers, hits Anna with an icy blast, causing her heart to slowly turn to ice. Of course, again, this is Disney, so the only thing that can fix it is true love's kiss. Kristoff rushes Arna back to Hans to Arendelle so he can save her life, but it turns out that won't work because Hans is the true evil one here and his kiss doesn't do anything, it's not true love. But by this time, Elsa has also returned to Arendelle and they're fighting, trying to save it from Hans. And at the very last moment in the fight, Arna jumps in front of Elsa, saving her life. It's this act of true love that thaws her frozen heart. Sisterly love, female empowerment, they don't need a man to save them. Throughout Frozen, you can clearly see the inspiration of the Snow Queen, but also how the story writers made an effort to modernise this story, make it applicable to 21st century life and children. The morals here are not to marry someone you've just met, the power of female relationships and sisterhood, platonic love, the power of believing in yourself. Because of course, at the end, Elsa manages to take control of her powers, reverse the eternal winter, and becomes a ruler beloved by all the kingdom. You don't need to rely on anyone else when you have yourself, and you have love. Another big way that Frozen departs from the Snow Queen is in the religious undertones. Now compared with a lot of fairy tales of this time, the Snow Queen actually wasn't all that religious, but it still undeniably talks about the devil and angels. Throughout the original tale, references are constantly made to a poem in which Jesus is mentioned. Gerda uses the Lord's Prayer to get her through that final hurdle. It seems in Disney's version, the religious elements are generally replaced with song. I mean, this is a Disney film after all, of course it's musical. I say that like we didn't all hear Let It Go on repeat in 2013 until it eventually drove us mad. The Disney version here takes out those heavier religious elements and replaces them with light-hearted songs. Or at least light-hearted, I suppose, on the outside. When you listen to the lyrics, they can feel quite a bit deeper. I mean, Do You Want to Build a Snowman, Anna's song to Elsa when they're kids, is undeniably about isolation and loneliness, a child not understanding why her sister no longer wants to play with her. Gerda to Kay after the ice overtook his heart, anyone? There's lots of similarities there. I should also mention Frozen 2 here as well, which whilst it does continue with the characters of Elsa and Anna and the rest of the cast, and therefore was undeniably inspired by the Snow Queen in that way, it does divulge a lot from the original Snow Queen story. It's a continuation, a story that Hans Christian Andersen never wrote, but it is inspired by him nonetheless. I'd say Frozen 2 actually takes a lot more from sort of general Nordic folklore, with Elsa hearing a mysterious voice that calls out to her through the enchanted forest to discover where her powers came from, why she is the way she is. Frozen 2 focuses much more on self-discovery. And with that, I think we're going to round up this video here. I think the Snow Queen and Frozen are different enough that they can stand on their own two feet. Frozen was inspired by, but not directly the same as the Snow Queen. There are lessons and morals we've taken from both of them. Undeniably, over the coming few decades, centuries, the Snow Queen will stand as the inspiration for many more tales. And in other ways, maybe Frozen will be the inspiration. The stories branching off to form many more. I don't know about you, but I've been really enjoying doing these sort of deep dives into the history of folklore and fairy tales at the moment. If you've got any requests that you want me to cover, then please do let me know. Thank you so much to June's Journey for sponsoring this video. Again, the link will be in the description box down below. And thank you for watching. Bye, guys.